Hi there. In this particular presentation, we are going to um, talk about cell death. So in the in the previous videos, we talked about um, you know basically cellular adaptations to stress, uh, whether it's normal or pathological stress, is applied to the the, the cells that make up our tissues, and then. Um, then we talked about how cells respond to various injurious agents in the video that was right before this. And then now we're going to talk about basically cellular death and different forms of it uh, that can occur within um, cells and tissues and organs and so on. So, so some kind of key takeaways to take away with this. First, we'll just kind of give an overview of cell death, uh, talk about it, what it is. Um, you know, probably the biggest thing to take away from this is talking about the different types of necrosis, what it is, uh, apoptosis, uh, it's not pronounced apoptosis like you would want to say it is, the second P is silent. Um, so apoptosis, re really understanding the difference between these two um, is going to be huge, uh, is, is, I guess is, for me is going to be my biggest goal for you folks that are watching this uh, to take away from this. And then I'll talk a little bit about autophagy, but not really a whole lot. Um, so I'm going to really focus you know, primarily on these two. So, so basically, when we think of cell death, um, you heard me say in the on the previous slide um, that there are, that there are two major classes of cell death. Uh, one of them being necrosis, the other one being apoptosis. Um, necro literally means death. All right. So now a couple things you have to keep in mind. Um, the about some basic differences between necrosis and apoptosis is that the is that they are both terms to describe some form of death but think of necrosis as being more on a on a larger scale all right think of necrosis as more of tissue injury um, you know this is something that you're going to be able to see with your own two eyes all right. Whereas apoptosis is a lot more subtle. Could just, you know, it's typically just a few cells within a tissue are dying through in a very specific fashion. All right. Um, causes are different between the two. So, for example, um, so when we think about noticeable cell death within a tissue, uh, what would be some things that could cause that? Well, you know, for example, hypoxia. All right. You know, hypoxia depending on the form of hypoxia, um, and typically. Uh, you know, the results of inflammation, all right, are going to cause necrosis, um, you know, exposure to chemicals, all right. So basically when we're thinking about, um, when we're when we're really thinking about uh, necrosis, the, really the big the the big 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 key difference here between apoptosis and necrosis is number two here: inflammation. All right, when apoptosis occurs, there is not going to be an inflammatory response just because it's only a couple cells at a time. All right, with necrosis, the dam the damage is so extensive to the tissue that the inflammatory response is going to ensue. So basically, when you see tissue necrosis, tissue death, it's going to be a culmination of inflammation and whatever the injurious agents were that basically activated the inflammatory response within the tissue. So that's something you need to keep in mind is that you're going to, with necrosis, you're going to see signs of inflammation, which obviously I'm not going to talk about in this video because that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a beast for another video. But just keep that in mind. All right. Um, and, you know, like I said, cells can, you know, tissues can become injured in various ways, chemically, uh, you know, hypoxic injury, physical injury, and so on. Um, now, typically when there's necrosis, the, there are different forms of necrosis that you're going to run into um, that can be very specific or very general, depending on the type of tissue that, that we're working with. So one thing you have to bear in mind is that when we're thinking about these, these well, I, sh I shouldn't have said general, these more specific forms of necrosis, um, is how a tissue dies or how a tissue looks when it dies a depends on the, the 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 makeup of the tissue you know the connective tissue elements of the tissue um, the cellular makeup of the tissue um, uh, the the extents of the inflammatory response within that tissue so you kind of have to keep all those factors in mind when you're thinking about how this tissue is going to present when it actually dies when you actually see it die all right 
So on that note, let's just uh, get into talking about the various forms of necrosis. Now, the first example that I want to talk about is coagulative necrosis. And coagulative necrosis is most is you most commonly see in the heart, so cardiac muscle, and also in the kidneys. All right, both of these are tissues that uh, have very heavy connective tissue elements, especially in their you know their parenchyma, their um, you know the 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 environment around the cells, the, 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 the tissue matrix, the skeleton of the tissue, essentially. Um, so heavy connective tissue elements and coagulative necrosis, hands down, is most commonly caused uh, due to ischemia. All right, caused by ischemia, I'm sorry. Ischemia, yeah, I can spell. All right. So sudden, so sudden loss of blood flow is hands down the most common cause of... Um, of coagulative necrosis. Now, this is what a, a rel this is what a normal sample of uh, cardiac muscle tissue would look like. So basically, you would see these striated cells. Um, you would see these intercalated discs. All right, you see the nucleus here because remember, cardiac muscle cells are a little different than skeletal muscle in the fact that they're smaller. Uh, they're branched, which you can you know you can see the branches. Um, you know they have these intercalated discs, so all the cells are united as uh, like like a like the heart is basically one unit. Um, and there's you know there's small spaces there there there's there's spaces in between the cardiac muscle cells. All right, so it's something you have to keep in mind. Now, if we're thinking about um, you know, then if we take a look at an example of coagulative necrosis, well, you can obviously see the the noticeable change here. So. Typically, now the one nice thing about coagulative necrosis is that is if you catch this if you catch this early enough, you know, especially this ischemic attack early enough, uh, typically the tissue tends to remain pretty well preserved, um, and this can be relatively, I don't want to say fixable, but you can uh, maintain a lot of tissue as long as this is caught early enough. Now, obviously, this is this is a, it's pretty obvious. You can see the coagulation here. Basically, what this is, is these are um, coagulating proteins. All right. Now, what's happening here in this situation is that um, is basically due to the lack of oxygen. Um, basically, you're going to see the kind of the, the the typical hallmark signs of hypoxia here. Um, you know, ischemia, hypoxia, etc. You know, basically the cells are going to swell. All right. Um, you know, you're going to see nuclear clumping. All right. The chromatin is going to clump. All right, which is called um, you know pinosis, p y k n o s i s. And then if this persists, then you're going to see what's called karyorexis. Um, basically, the chromatin is going to fragment and damage, or you know, basically fall apart. Um, and then as it falls apart and fades away, you're going to see what's called karyolysis. Basically, that you know that dark nucleus is going to kind of become more light in appearance. It's going to, which I mean, obviously you can't really see any nuclei here. Um, and then basically you're going to see the loss of the nuclei in general. All right, and then um, and then basically as the cells die and fall apart, then you're going to start to see proteins accumulate in the tissue spaces. Um, and cause kind of a you know these little kind of solid masses, hence the term coagulative necrosis. All right, so basically that's something you have to really keep in mind with with this is that you know as this hypoxic can, as if this hypoxic state really persists, you know you're going to really see a lot of changes within the nucleus, and then as the cell breaks apart, falls apart, these proteins coagulate in the tissue spaces. All right, so that's basically coagulative necrosis, very common to the. Um, Excuse me. Very common to the um, to the kidneys and the heart. <sighs> Next, uh, I want to talk about what's called liquefactive necrosis, which is hands down the most common in the central nervous system, primarily due to a lack of connective tissue. Remember, the brain and spinal cord don't actually have connective tissue. In the you know in the parenchyma in the, in the actual in the in the in the in the tissue matrix in the tissue spaces. So due to the lack of connective tissue, what happens when you see cellular, cellular degradation of the central nervous system? It's going to become you're they're, they're, you're not going to see a lot of proteins to coagulate and accumulate. So what's going to happen is it's just this tissue is going to become very liquid in appearance. All right, and again is most um, most oftenly caused by ischemia. Once in a while, you can also see with a bacterial infection. I mean, just think back for a second. Remember. Remember if you've ever seen a cut in your skin before and then you've seen this pus build up in there? All right, and you saw that pus had kind of a yellow 
and a little bit of a whitish hue to it. All right, you know, basically that's the, you know that's some liquefactive necrosis going on there because when you have damage to the skin um, and you see that pus building up in there, basically the yellow is going to be a combination of the the bacteria that's in there. Um, and then the tissue damage that's occurring most almost commonly as a result of the of the inflammation that's a, that's occurring there, and then the white would be the leukocytes that are infiltrating the area, you know, trying to contain and 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 uh, and destroy the path, contain and destroy the pathogens that are located there. Um, so initially, you know, a lot of neutrophils and so on. Um, so that's something you have to keep in mind. So, um, so, so again, you can see liquefactive necrosis and, you know, again, with certain bacterial infections. Um, and, but like I said, if we're thinking about the central nervous system, like I said, this is most commonly found, you know, like, you know, like with a stroke, you know, which you can see right here in the brain. So basically when you see, so when someone has your typical stroke, um, you know, when, when blood flow is cut off to an area of the brain, then what's going to happen is, um, you know, th this tissue is going to die. All right. These neurons and the glial cells are going to die and fall apart. Excuse me. And then what's going to happen is that, you know, the, these tissues are just, you know, like I said, they're just going to fall apart and die. And, you know, like I said, there really won't be any coagulation taking place and then especially if there you know especially when there's a blockage here and then we remove that blockage then remember remember your your the idea of a reperfusion injury here basically what's going to happen as we as we circulate a bunch of uh, oxygen into you know I, I should say is we just recirculate blood into here and we pump a bunch of oxygen to the area of injury then what's going to happen is you're going to increase your free radical production all right, I'm just going to abbreviate radical rads. All right, and then basically, as you accumulate, as, as, as the oxygen mixes with these um, with these anaerobic uh, metabolites that were located in the in the area of injury, then basically these free radicals are going to cause even more damage, not just to the cells, but to the proteins in the environment, which causes this tissue to further liquefy. All right, and then and then basically that is very pro-inflammatory. All right, and then you're going to see inflammation occurring, and then basically once this mess is cleaned up here. Um, you know, basically once that's cleaned up, then what you're basically, what you're going to be left with is you're going to be left with a cavity, all right, or an empty area where that damage occurred. All right. So you see the soft liquefied tissue with liquefactive necrosis. Uh, uh, caseous necrosis is a combination of the of the previous two that we just talked about, a uh, combination of coagulative and uh, liquefactive necrosis, and is hands down uh, most predominantly seen in tuberculosis. Uh, remember, tuberculosis is, an, is, is a lung infection caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculi. Uh, I'm sorry, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and uh, so what happens here is, is that you see, like I said, it's a combination of the two. And what we form is we form what are called granulomas. All right, granulomas um, inside of this, uh, inside of this uh, lung tissue where the infection occurs. All right, now if we take a look at the, at, at the, at the pathogen Mycobacterium tuberculi, you know, it's a pretty big sluggish bacterium that has a relatively unique um, cell, uh, a fatty wall um, that, uh, and, and, and which makes it, a, like I said, a unique bacterium. But, uh, but when we attack this, we attack it, you know, our, our immune system attacks it voraciously. So remember your first responder cells, you know, your neutrophils, all right, are going to be the first are going to be the cells that are going to attack this. Remember, neutrophils are predominantly designed to attack, um, you know, bacteria. All right, because remember they 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 are capable of phagocytosis. All right, remember they have these kind of multilobular uh, nuclei. They contain a lot of granules. All right, so then when they get to the area of injury where there's an, and again they're not a, they're, they're not just recruited to areas where there's an infections, but these are the first responders. Typically, there's tissue injury in general. All right, and then what's going to happen is that but in this situation we have a bacterial infection. So what's going to happen then is the neutrophils are going to are going to get to the area where the infection is and they're going to degranulate.
all right, they're going to degranulate and they're going to release these lytic enzymes and these chemicals that they use to basically destroy, you know, the bacteria that, that are in the environment. Now, you have to remember that this is very nonspecific, right? This is very, very nonspecific. Inflammation, the inflammatory response, is part of your innate immunity, all right, because this isn't targeting. And I mean, granted, yes, I said the neutrophils are going to the area where there's bacteria and attacking them, but they're just dumping out all these lytic chemicals into the tissue environment. These, 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 these lytic chemicals are going to do more than just attack bacteria. They're going to destroy the surrounding tissue, the, the surrounding uh, tissue that, that's exposed to them as well. All right. So then, so so the proteins in the connective tissue environment, the uh, you know so various cells in the area are potentially going to be broken down by these lytic, you know, by these by these you know free radicals and um, and lytic enzymes and so on. And that basically is where the liquefactive aspect of this comes in. All right, that's basically where the liquefactive side of this comes in. All right, and then um, so then basically what we're so what we're going to see here then is um, it, but the, some of these proteins that are located in this environment are going to basically coagulate and clump together. So basically, in the, and when you put the two together, that's when you get the granuloma. So the outside of the granuloma is going to be. I don't want to say it's going to be very tough, but obviously it's not going to be liquid either. It's going to be kind of like it's going to be this kind of thick gelatinous coagulation of you know proteins and you know fluids and so on. And then in the center of this granuloma, the center of the granuloma is where the liquefaction occurs. That's basically you know, it, or we can say that's basically where the pus is. All right, that's where the pus is located. So basically, what you're going to see here is included in this pus. You're going to see again, you know, the the bacterium itself. You're going to see the neutrophils, and you're going to see basically decimated tissue in the center of this granuloma. So basically, when there's caseous necrosis, the tissue is not really present. Well, it's not really. It's not preserved uh, where these granulomas are located. All right, so that's something you have to keep in mind, which is obviously why it's important that we need to catch uh, tuberculosis early because if this persists, uh, basically the immune system is going to destroy the lungs from the inside out while attacking this bacterium. All right. So, you know, that's, and that's why they do chest x-rays. You know, if you, if you're taking your, if you're a, an aspiring healthcare professional and, you know, before you do any kind of clinical rotation or work in the clinical field, you have to take a Mantu test. And um, and obviously, if you fail that, then you then the next step in the process is taking a chest X-ray, and that's basically what they're looking for. Is you know it'll it'll you'll it'll you'll look like you you'll, you'll see it almost look like pellets in your chest, or you can see an area of lung tissue that has basically been you know just caved in and destroyed. All right, you know a big gap in there. So, but but basically, that's essentially what caseous necrosis is, and it's often described. You know, when you look at it from a pathological perspective, it has a very cheese-like appearance to it. It looks like you know coagulated cheese. All right, so that's caseous necrosis. Like I said, most commonly associated with tuberculosis, and is typically a combination of the two, um, coagulative and liquefactive necrosis. Fat necrosis is typically pretty specific to the pancreas. Oops. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, which is typically a result of pancreatitis. Um, excuse me. Uh, and what happens here, basically, uh, with this is you see what's called saponification. Basically, what you're literally looking at in this pancreas is soap. All right, you're literally looking at soap here. So um, now, like I said, I said it's I said it's predominantly specific to the pancreas, but you can also see it in other areas as well. Because, well, stop for a second. Think of an area of the body where there is a high, high content of body fat, naturally, where, where, where there would be a high amount of body fat. Okay, breast tissue. Okay, breast tissue. So basically where there is... Now it's a little now how this you know how the saponification occurs is going to be a little different you know it's going to it's going to be different in the pancreas you know, like with pancreatitis than it's going to be with the with breast tissue and let's talk about those so when we're thinking about pancreatitis um, basically what happens here 
are are basically cells are going to be broken down in the pancreas, and then what's going to happen are various um, you know various enzymes are going to leak, and again the enzyme you know in particular here lipase. All right. So then, what lipase is gonna what, what's gonna happen here? Because I mean, there's gonna be a ton of digestive enzymes located in the pancreas, because that's the pancreas's main job. I mean, we could say about 98 percent of the job of the pancreas is to is to produce secretions that aid in digestion, primarily the small intestine in digestion. All right. Whether it's digestive enzymes or various um, buffers to try to um, neutralize the high acidity of the chyme that, that goes from the stomach um, into the small intestine. Now, basically, what's going to happen here then is as these lipases are are um, broken are, are released out of these damaged cells and they get into you know other cells of the uh, of the pancreas what's going to happen is that's going to cause um, digestion of fats and especially of triglycerides all right and as these tri as these triglycerides are released cuz you have to remember that you know um, that that they're that there really isn't a whole lot of calcium located inside of cells, or really none at all. So then what's going to happen is as we digest these, trigly digest these triglycerides and they're broken down into, I'm just going to abbreviate this, fatty acids, what's going to happen then is these fatty acids are going to be released from these damaged cells and then they're going to combine with minerals. All right, they're going to combine with extracellular minerals and as we put those together, we are literally going to form soap. All right. You're going to form soap because that's essentially what soap is: fat and minerals mixed together. All right. Um, so this would be an example of what's called enzymatic fat necrosis. All right, enzymatic fat necrosis. Now the other. Now if we're thinking about breast tissue, all right, we, there, there aren't di there aren't you know digestive enzymes. Um, there aren't digestive enzymes in the. Um, you know, in, in breast tissue, so this is going to occur as a result of trauma. That's so so when we see saponification and fat necrosis occur in breast tissue, we would classify that as traumatic fat necrosis. All right, traumatic fat necrosis. So what we're going to see here is like, I don't know, let's think of a car accident. You know, a, a, a lady's driving down the road, um, gets in a head-on collision, steering column, boom, goes right into the chest. Uh, just crushes that, you know, crushes the, you know, the breast tissue, causes a lot of those fat cells, those, you know, those, those adipocytes to break open. And then basically those fats, you know, because remember adipocytes, you know, store, um, you know, store fats and, um, and then, you know, kind of like an oily liquid form. And then what's going to happen is as, as, as all those lipids, um, you know, get released out of the, out of the adipocytes in the breast, again, same thing. Then, then you see the same process here. You're going to basically see um, see these fats mixed with you know calcium and other minerals to form these you know basically literally these soaps. All right, these soaps. So that's something you have to keep in mind. All right, so that's something you have to keep in mind. So we've got this fat plus calcium equals saponification. All right, so like I said, the type of necrosis is very specific to um, areas where there's a lot of fat, you know, the pancreas, lots of lytic enzymes, um, enzymes, you know, are released, activated, break down triglycerides, fatty acids are released, combined with calcium, form soap, breast tissue, traumatic fat necrosis here. All right. So that's fat necrosis. And then this one, this is the one that people that, that, that can get a little uh, horrific with, um, when it comes to looking at, uh, images and so on, but gangrenous necrosis is typically a result of severe, um, you know, hypoxia, say ischemia. All right, lack of blood flow. And again, how quickly this develops depends on um, depends on the, you know, basically depends on the uh, how how deprived that tissue is of blood, how rapidly um, this occurs, and so on. Now, um, there are two major types of gangrene that can occur. Uh, there's what's called dry gangrene, and then there's what's called wet gangrene. Um, I, sorry to use such uh, graphic images, but get used to seeing stuff like this. 
dry gangrene. Um, obviously, you can see why it's called dry gangrene because you don't really see any liquefaction taking place. Um, you know, basically, you don't see you don't see any liquefaction of tissues taking place. You just see generalized tissue death. Now, what you see here, um, you know, like, like I said, this is very common, especially when you think of like a dry gangrene is going to be a lot more common. You know, basically around the areas of the skin, superficial areas of the body. Now, it doesn't. Now, again, wet gangrene, as you can see, can occur in areas in the skin as well. Now, with um, wet gangrene, uh, or I'm sorry, with dry gangrene, you notice here that the you see the blackening of the toes. This is something you typically see with this uh, blackening of the tissues. I mean, that tissue is gone. All right. These, um, you know, this is a, this is a diabetic foot. All right. This is a, you know, remember with, uh, with someone who has uh, chronic diabetes, what's going to happen? One of, one of the major complications is uh, well, this right here, and what happens? How how you get to this point in a in a nutshell is um, is uh, the basically you have this you know high blood pressure, this higher viscosity blood that uh, damages the, the the microcirculation, the small vessels that supply these peripheral nerves with uh, blood and then these nerves slowly die and then basically these tissues can't uh, you know basically there's no nothing signaling these tissues to regenerate and undergo you know mitosis and so on and then as a result they um, you know the, these you know the, the the you can you can see the result death all right um, now this is typically uh, you know again this is it, it, like I said it takes a while to get to this point it's slow onset I mean you don't just wake up you know a week, you know you don't just a week you know but get diabetes and a, you know type two diabetes and a week later all of a sudden your toes look like this all right you know it takes a while to build up to this because typically what happens first is you'll start to have numbness and tingling you know or or just uh, odd feelings in your extremities um, and then you can have uh, loss of hair. Uh, you know, again, around the ankles, the feet, or in the hands, the wrist, and so on. All right. And then, um, obviously, you're going to see, you know, the you know, telltale signs of inflammation because this is damaged and destroyed tissue. Um, but uh, but then, you know, like I said, you get the picture here. This is bad news. And then what you can see here is that these toes are going to be removed. All right. That's going to be – that's essentially the end result of this dry gangrene is removal. And another reason why this stays dry as well cuz uh, you know all the dead proteins and damaged proteins um, from these tissues uh, from these dead cells coagulated together and you know, like I said the state you know the skin stayed relatively intact and liquefaction did not occur. All right. Um, you know another example of gangrene that can occur um, just in general is for example if you have um, you know a hernia you know, if you have a, you know, remember hernia is basically when an organ uh, protrudes or invades into an area that it doesn't belong. And, uh, you know, basically, and, and in order to do that, you know, some, you know, like, for example, a loop of the small intestine could, uh, you know, could, could, could protrude into, you could uh, protrude into another body cavity like your inguinal area. And then, you know, that, and then that, you know, that, 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 that small intestine could be compressed and then cause tissue death there. You could get what's called a volvulus when you're basically it's what happens in your intestines kind of wrap around each other. All right, you know that could cause um, gang, you know, gangrene as well. So it's more than just having dying or damaged blood vessels um, or a lack of blood flow. I mean, like I said, well, I mean, granted, this, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, if your if your intestines loop or, or or get you know compressed, that will cause gangrene of them as well. All right, so this is dry gangrene and then wet gangrene. Well, you can probably figure out why we call this wet gangrene, um, just because it is more wet. So if we're looking at the skin, basically what you're going to notice here is that obviously the, the area where the gangrene is occurring is going to be wet, moist. Uh, it's typically very cold. Why would it be cold? Think about that for a second. Why would it be cold? Give up, but you got to remember what do we say is 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 pretty much the common cause of gangrene, lack of blood flow, right? Whether it's damaged vessels, complications of diabetes, and so on. So if you if you don't if you have a limited amount or no blood going to this area, well, it's going to be cold to the touch. All right, again, you know, uh, even though 
uh, you know, you're going to see, a, you know, blackening skin in this area as well, just like you see with dry gangrene. But the biggest key factor here is the is the liquefaction. Now, typically, so basically around the outside of this area where this wet gangrene is occurring, it's going to be dry. All right. But in here, it's going to be wet. All right. So basically here, there's no blood flow. All right. There is no regeneration of cells and tissues in here. This is literally rotting tissue. All right. This is rotting tissue. Now, obviously, this is bad. Well, we, that's, you know, dry gangrene is bad too. But this is potentially worse because now you have a constantly exposed area. It's relatively, now all of a sudden, bacteria can get in here. That's why if you're taking care of somebody that has uh, wet gangrene, you know, like for example, if you're taking care of somebody that has a decubitus ulcer, otherwise known as a bed sore, all right, one of the things you constantly have to do is clean and, you know, pack the area full of gauze, all right, you know, pack the area full of gauze, replace it all the time, all right, because, um, you know, because again, if this accumulates, bacteria could get into the system and that could cause some uh, very, very uh, extreme complications. So that's something you have to bear in mind. And um, and dry gangrene can be can convert to wet gangrene if the, if bacteria actually do penetrate. You know, if bacteria can actually get into these areas where this is occurring and cause liquefaction to occur, because then you're going to see inflammation, um, neutrophils, enzymes, breakdown of tissue, and so on. All right, you're going to see you know lots of inflammation. So that essentially is gangrene, you know, which, like I said, is most commonly caused due to a uh, lack of blood flow to an area. And then the graphic images are not done yet. Another form of gangrene they may run into is called gas gangrene. All right, gas gangrene. Now, gas with gas gangrene, um, this is a little more specific. This is when you, there there are many different forms of there are many different versions of um, um, Clostridium bacteria out there, but that's what this is predominantly caused by. Now, one of the things you have to bear in mind about the about Clostridium is that they are anaerobes. All right, and we're going to talk about why this is important in a minute. All right, now typically, you know, in nature, these bacteria are predominantly found in the soil, dirt, and so on. All right. And what happens, how people get to this point, or how people get this, is that you get a cut in your skin, and then, uh, and then obviously, you know, you get, you come in contact with some exposed soil or wherever these Clostridium back, you know, or you know where these Clostridium bacteria are located, and then what they do is they get into a cut, and then what they do is they get into the muscle tissue of the area. All right, they get it, they get into the muscle tissue of the area. Excuse me. And um, and then what they do is they produce these these toxins or enzymes, these chemicals that they release. And what you see here basically is muscle death. All right. So these enzymes, the, 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 these these lytic enzymes and toxins and chemicals that they release cause widespread destruction. Obviously, it starts in the area where you know obviously where they're infecting, and it's going to spread from there. So you're seeing widespread muscle death. All right. Now, this is obviously going to get really problematic if those, you know, those enzymes, those toxins, those 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 lytic chemicals they release, if they get into the, if, if they work their way into the into the circulatory system, and then they get circulated all around the body, you can do the math on how damaging that could potentially be. That's that could, I mean, that's, those are going to destroy any organ they potentially come in contact with. All right, and then obviously you can see that this is gaseous, you know, because these are, you know, these 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 bacteria are going to release gases, you know, you know, while they're you know undergoing their metabolism as a waste product, and that's why you see the puffing up of the tissues in these areas. All right. Now, if caught early enough, um, this you know obviously gas gangrene, you can this can be you know, this can be a salvageable um, ordeal to deal with. Um, and, you know, again, this is kind of what I was leading to earlier, uh, death via sepsis, shock, etc. Um, but, you know, this can be a reversible process uh, if it's caught early enough. And the reason why I mentioned, you know, I, I really wanted to emphasize on the anaerobic aspect of this, uh, one of the things that they'll do, especially if you're really, if, especially if you catch it early enough and you're trying to preserve a limb or a tissue, um, you, you, you can treat it with hyperbaric oxygen. So you put somebody in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which is basically you put them in a chamber that's highly concentrated with oxygen, and then basically they are just flooded with oxygen. So then basically all of this oxygen basically 
is harmful to to these anaerobes and damages and destroys them. And you know, like I said, if you can get this early enough and and destroy these and destroy these, then you can preserve the the tissue. Obviously, this is to the point to where amputation is going to occur. Um, this was something we we especially saw a lot of um, you know during you know like, like you think about during World War II with all the trench warfare that was occurring. You know, when people were you know in trenches, you're getting injured and hurt all the time in an area in an area like that, and then you're constantly in the soil you're getting a lot of um, bacteria into these cuts and these wounds and then you know obviously you're fighting on for days and so on and a lot of times you know that led to a lot of amputations just as a result of bacterial infections all right so that is essentially gas gangrene if left untreated uh, if you don't amputate if you can't get to it quick enough causes uh, sepsis shock and death all right. So those are so basically those are the various forms of uh, necrosis that I talked about. And like I said, you, you, I mean, hopefully you saw the point that I was making before as do these various forms of necrosis are pretty specific to the tissues that the, that these are occurring in. And you saw a common theme, lack of blood flow, um, you know, ischemic tissues, uh, you know, in, you know, in, inflammation occurring and so on. So kind of so keep that in mind as you're thinking about this and studying these. Now apoptosis is uh, like I said before is much more subtle than necrosis. All right, it's much more subtle than necrosis. It, it's typically one or a few cells, um, you know, death that's occurring. And you know, like I said, the very similar things can cause it can induce apoptosis. You know, it could be exposure exposure to chemicals. All right, you know, like free radicals or other chemicals, um, you know, metabolic or metabolites that damage cells. Um, apoptosis can occur just due to, you know, again, if you see, um, not hypoxia, um, you know, if you see abnormalities in the cell cycle, uh, like for example, if you're looking at a cell in the S phase, all right, and it's replicating its DNA and there are replication errors. All right, we have various genetic checkpoints that put cells in kind of a stasis called G0, the gap, you know, gap zero phase. And if we can't get out, you know, basically if we can't, if a cell is damaged to the point uh, where it's beyond repair, then it will systematically kill itself. All right. Um, but like I said, the, the, the biggest thing here, when you're thinking about apoptosis, is that there won't be inflammation. Okay, in, okay, so you won't see inflammation here. Um, now, like, and, and the other thing as well is that when, when, when cells become necrotic and they die, they look, I mean, they're just an absolute mess, all right? You know, they, they swell, all right, they, they swell up, then the nucleus falls apart. You know, you heard me talking about that, uh, you know, a little while ago when I was talking about how, you know, hypoxic cells die. Okay, the membranes break open, all right, all these various proteins and enzymes are released. I mean, you know, like I said, it, 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 it almost, it almost kind of looks like the cell exploded even though it didn't, all right, and then all this debris material was leaked out of there. And you see that with, um, with necrosis. With apoptosis, there are very specific morphological features that are associated with apoptosis, all right, that, 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 and it has to do with the systematic way of how a cell gets rid of itself. Now, you have to remember that apoptosis can occur under normal conditions um, or in response to stress, damage, and so on. All right. So this is an image of kind of a very general image of apoptosis. Now, something you have to remember about this is that this is, I'm not going to go into depth about this because honestly, you can probably make one and a half lecture videos on, on just apoptosis itself. It's an incredibly complex process that has, that, that's, that's very, that, that's very tightly genetically regulated, um, has very specific, uh, chemical events that occur. All right. It's a very, very systematic process of a cell basically offing itself or getting rid of itself. All right. So that's something you have to bear in mind. So basically what we're going to see first is notice how the cell is basically condensing in size. All right. So there's so basically the cytoplasm is going to shrink down and basically the chromatin in the nucleus is going to condense. Now obviously right here that should be a that should be a factor that makes you realize this is much different than necrosis because remember when we were talking about necrosis said so the necrosis is most commonly caused by hypoxic injuries, cells swell. 
All right, cells swell when they are necrotic. When, necrotic, when they are necrotic. Okay, apoptotic cells shrink. All right, apoptotic cells shrink. All right, and then what happens are basically areas, and then basically what happens is is the um, is as the cell shrivels up. Basically, what what you're doing is you're forming these structures called apoptotic bodies. All right, apoptotic bodies. Okay, so basically this is so basically these are so this is so basically these are areas of cell membrane that have that have condensed and obviously just form these small cellular bodies with the, that could contain organelles and other materials within them. All right, um, and then basically the cell is just going to continue to shrink and fragment and form these apoptotic bodies that contain these various cellular components, and then eventually what's going to happen are phagocytes are going to come by. And they are going to phagocytize these apoptotic bodies and clean up the mess. All right. So, you know, like I said, um, and then basically the cell is done. All right. Then you can see the neighboring cells uh, in this process remain unaffected by this process. Um, you know, so like I said, apoptosis can occur. Like I said, this could just occur as a result of natural means. Because you have to remember, cells have a lifespan. All right, cells have a lifespan. Cells are eventually going to die. All right, and if they get older, and, and as they get older, and you know, just become more damaged or just age, and they and then they they get to a point to where there's just where they can't really function, or they can't, uh, or they could just just get damaged. What they're going to do is, like I said, they can kill themselves. Um, and then, but, but that's a natural process because we want to replace these aging cells with newer cells. So basically what's going to happen is th as this neighboring cell died, well, now all of a sudden there's a little space in the tissue. Now all of a sudden, okay, well, look, this can undergo mitosis, boom, boom, and we replace. So now all of a sudden we replace that cell. So like I said, apoptosis is not only a, a response to pathologic, um, stressors or stimuli it can just be a relatively like i said it's a relatively normal part of life cellular life as well all right so but like i said you have to really understand these differences between the two between apoptosis and um necrosis all right no inflammation here inflammation with necrosis all right um cellular shrinkage is the other key distinguishing factor here um, you know, cellular swelling with necrosis, very systematic, very, from a biochemical perspective, very methodical, um, you know, then you're left with these, these very, these, these specific apoptotic bodies. When a cell dies, uh, during necrosis, it's just an absolute mess. All right. When you get to the end of its life. Okay. And then the last thing I want to talk about, which I really don't want to talk about much in depth, just because people it's just not something you really run into very often, but autophagy, just basically self-eating. Um, and uh, basically, this is very typical of a cell that is uh, that is starved. Uh, if we need to recycle uh, parts or whatnot. Um, but basically, this is when the cell cannibalizes itself. So what it'll do is, you know, is, um, you know, we can take out, you know, we can take old broken down parts of the cytoskeleton, um you know, broken on parts of the cytoskeleton or old damaged organelles. All right, create these, um, create these, uh, these cytoplasmic blebs. You know, contain them with this dead or damaged material. Phagocytes come by and eat them. All right, we can break down these organelles, use them for our cells. But that's really basically what this means is uh, just cells uh, self eating. And this is probably the last time you'll ever hear me talk about this. So, so that's autophagy. Um, and then these are the images that I use in this presentation. And that is basically how cells respond to uh, injury and stress and uh, how they die if we are unable to fix that. So next up will be innate immunity and inflammation. That is what's going to be coming around the bend next. In fact, I actually already have a video on innate immunity, so I need to get working on inflammation.